Uh, good morning, everybody. So glad that uh, some of you braved the blizzard this morning to join us here in person. Also grateful for those that are watching online and uh, worshiping with us in that way. Uh, you know, how we perceive people determines how we relate to people. So uh, if you say to yourself, my boss doesn't like me, people, uh, you know, he doesn't like people like me, my boss scares me, my boss is always pointing out what I do wrong, he must not think that I'm doing a good job, then everything your boss does is going to reinforce that perception of him, and you'll continue assuming the worst. But what if you found out you knew the boss's son, and that through his eyes you found out the boss was actually a great guy, and you found out that he is the best dad in the world to his kids? And what if you met one of your coworkers who worked for the family business for 20 years, and they started telling you stories about all of the employees that your boss had helped to go on to bigger and better things in their life? And then you might realize that your boss likes people like you, that your boss is not scary, that he's actually a teddy bear on the inside, that your boss gives you a hard time because he believes in you and he wants to make you better so that you can go on and be successful in life. And that would just change everything in the world. It would, it would make work so much more meaningful. It would make your future look so much brighter if you knew that you were part of this family business that has helped people like you in the past to, to move on and to have a great and successful life. You see, how we perceive someone determines how we relate to them. And it's the same thing with God. Our perception of God determines everything about how we relate to God. If you say, God doesn't like people like me. God is always angry with me. God scares me. God is like a traffic cop who is just hiding behind the corner with his radar gun, just waiting to catch me doing something wrong. God is always pointing out my flaws. I can never please him. God is so distant from my life. He doesn't really care about me. Uh, he doesn't care about how I live my life. These are all the perceptions you might have about God that can negatively affect your relationship with God. You can get so much more out of your work life if you have a right perception of how your boss feels about you. You can get so much more out of your spiritual life if you have a right perception about how God sees you. We've just learned that Jesus is calling us to develop our integrity and our character and our behavior. And if your perception of God is that he is a traffic cop waiting to find something wrong with you, then you might perceive what we've just learned about character and behavior. You might perceive that with fear, saying, God, I can't do this. I'm, I'm afraid that God is going to catch me doing something wrong and he's going to harm me in some way or I'm scared that God is always angry with me because I'm not able to do the things that I want to do. If your perception of God is you can never please him and then you see Jesus teaching about spiritual growth, that Jesus loves us where we're at, but Jesus doesn't accept us, uh, that, that, that Jesus doesn't want to leave us where we're at. What happens if in two years you're still struggling with some of those things we talked about over the last few weeks, then that is going to be so frustrating for you because it's only going to reinforce the way that you see God. See, I told you I can never please God. I told you God is always angry with me. Why should I even try? God is so distant. He doesn't care. You see, how you perceive God is so vital to you being able to live out the victorious life and the great life that Jesus died for you and I to have. Jesus died so that we could have a better life, so that we could have a hope and a future, so that our life could be impacted in some way, not just for eternity, not just for, for some distant future, but in the here and the now. And in this series, we're going to learn how Jesus taught his followers to, to see God, to perceive God, and to understand what God is like and how that can radically change your prayer life and really everything about how you relate to God. So what did Jesus teach 
about how we should perceive God? Well, you know, the disciples, they were caught up in some of these same kinds of things that we are. The disciples were as confused as we are. They had all of these same ideas about God because it's part of the human experience. We all wonder, does God care? Does God love me? Is God angry with me? Is God waiting to catch me when I do something wrong? Can I ever please God? Human history is full of those kind of ideas and human beings trying to figure that out. And then the disciples, they meet God's son and they met Jesus, someone who knew God in a different way than anyone else did. And Jesus' view of God was different because he was God's unique son. How he, how he talked to God was different. How he spent time with God was different. How he approached God was different. How, how Jesus perceived God was different than anything else the disciples had ever seen before. And this intrigued them. They had never seen anyone else approach God in the same way before. Luke tells us that the disciples asked him one day, you know, we see you praying and we see you going off alone with God and it just seems different about the way that you do that. Jesus, can you teach us to pray? Can you teach us what it is that you do? Can you teach us to relate to God the way that you do? How to have this relationship with God that you have and Jesus says, I can do that. And so he taught them about God, and in the Lord's Prayer, a prayer that's familiar to many of us, in Jesus' prayer, he does something that maybe you haven't noticed before. Uh, in Jesus' prayer, he teaches his disciples how he perceives God and how that affects everything about his relationship with God. And, and Jesus' prayer is structured around two different ways to view God. First of all, Jesus said this, Jesus said, Abba, Father. He says, when you pray, understand that God is Abba. He is Daddy. He is your dad. He is your father. Abba is the word in Jesus' language for Daddy uh, or Dada, just like little kids say Dada or uh, Daddy when we're try first trying to talk. Jesus is saying, approach God as, as if you're a little child. And he is Dada, he is Daddy, he is Dad. And, and this is a bit of a revelation to them. This radically reinterprets how they are going to relate to God. Jesus says, think of God like the best father that you could imagine. And, you know, if you didn't have a great father, don't worry about that. But picture God like this ideal father, which you imagine the perfect father to be. Jesus says, that is who God is. God is Father. And then Jesus says, God is King. He says, your kingdom come, your will be done. So Jesus is saying, picture God as your dad and picture God as your king. And what does Jesus say in the first two lines of the Lord's Prayer? Our Father who is in heaven, may your name be kept holy. May your kingdom come soon and may your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. So Jesus says, when you talk to God, if you perceive God as your dad and as your king, it will radically transform your prayer life. And so over the next two weeks, I just want to unpack what it means that God is our Father and that God is our King and how that shapes our perception of God and the way that we relate to God. First today, I want to look at Jesus' prayer. The first line here, our Father who is in heaven, holy is your name, that God is our Father. A couple of interesting things about this idea that God is our Father is, first of all, the Father image is linked to God as our Creator. James says this about God. He says, whatever is good and perfect is a gift coming down to us from God our Father, who created all the lights in the heavens. So the idea that God is our Father is linked to the idea that God is our Creator. He never changes or casts a shifting shadow. He chose to give birth to us. Again, the idea of creation by giving us his true word and we out of all of his creation became his prized possession. So the idea that God is father is linked to creation. God is our father. God is our creator. Those two ideas are linked. God is the one who brought us into the world. God is the one who gave us life just like we received life from our parents. And in that sense, God is our father, our parents, and God has given us life. This, this idea that God is father reminds us that God is our creator. He's the one who gave us life. Second of all, the father image is linked to God being a father of the fatherless. Psalm 68, 5, 
just leading up into this verse, it says, sing praises to God, sing loud praises to him. His name is the Lord. Rejoice in his presence. Well, why should we rejoice in God's presence? Isn't God mean? Isn't God scary? Isn't God out to get me? No, rejoice in his presence because he is a father to the fatherless. Have you ever felt fatherless? You know, some of us grew up in, in families where dad was absent. Some of us grew up in families where dad was a tyrant. Some of us grew up in families where dad was abusive. And if you grew up with that, maybe picture God as the perfect father. He's not your dad, but he's the ideal father. Some of us grew up in homes where our father was great, and he was a good example of what a father might be. Then picture that. But if you grew up without a dad or with a messed up dad, God wants to be a father to you. God says, you're not alone. You do have a father. I'm a father to the fatherless. I'm a defender of widows. I rise up and defend those who are oppressed and in need. Uh, Third, the father image is linked to a future king of David and a future people. There's actually two verses in the Old Testament that link a prophecy about how a king of David is going to call out to God as his father. And we have Psalm 89, verse 26, that says this. Now, keep in mind that this is Psalm 89. It's written during the exile. It's written about the Davidic king that even though God has taken away the Davidic kingdom, it's going to rise up again. There's going to be another king again. One day, a descendant of David who's going to rise up and take the throne. So that's the context, which means that this is eventually about Jesus, This is what it says. It says, And he, this Davidic king, will call out to me, You are my father, my God, and the rock of my salvation. I will make him my firstborn son, the mightiest king on earth. So that's cool. Psalm 89 says that this future king is going to call out to God as father. And that's how Jesus talks about God. Abba, father, daddy, father. And then catch this. There's this verse that says that God's people are going to one day call God Father. And the context here again is about after the exile, God's people are going to return. And God says this, God says, I myself said, how gladly would I treat you like my children and give you a pleasant land, the most beautiful inheritance of any nation. I thought you would call me Father and not turn away from father following me. So I wanted you to call me Father. And Jeremiah's words, he says, I, I want to point this out. They come into this, this context of a future covenant. So God wants us to live in a covenant relationship with him, and he longs for us to call him Father. So God is our Father. God is our Creator. God's a Father to the fatherless. And one day a Davidic king is going to come, and he's going to call God Father. In fact, Jesus fulfilled this prophecy by the way that he prayed. Uh, The night before Jesus went to the cross, he cries out, Abba, Father, Daddy, Dad, I'm in trouble. I need you. Everything's possible for you. Take this cup of suffering for me. Anyone ever felt like praying a prayer like that? God, what are you doing? What are you taking me through right now? It's too tough. It's so hard. If possible, please take it away. Remove it from me, and I want your will to be done in my life, not mine. So Jesus cries out, Abba, Father, when he prays. And this is how the disciples hear him pray, and this influences their prayer life, and it influences their view of God, and they start to talk in this language of family and covenant because that's what Jesus' prayer life is teaching them. Jesus is teaching them to pray the language of family and the language of covenant. And and Romans 8, 15, Paul says that we're not slaves, we're family. He says, we've not received a spirit that makes us fearful slaves, but we have received God's spirit when he, what? When he adopted us as his own kids. So Paul's starting to talk using Jesus' language of family and covenant. We're no longer slaves, we're family. All of us have have trusted in Christ, received God's spirit because we've been adopted as God's own kids. And then, get this, now we call him what? We call him Abba, Father. Just like Jesus, when he talked to God, he called God Abba, Father, but because he was God's unique son. Now we call him Abba, Father, because we've been adopted. For God's spirit joins with our spirit to affirm that we are God's children. So this idea that we're God's children is this family covenant covenant imagery. It's the idea that we are part of this family. 
And what do we say about family? Well, we say blood is thicker than water. Ever heard that expression? Family is joined together by a covenant of blood. And we're joined together by the new covenant of the blood of Jesus. And blood is thicker than water. Jesus' new way that he's teaching us to perceive God is through the lens of father, through the lens of family, through the lens of covenant. It's a covenant family relationship. We've been brought into this covenant relationship where God is our father and we are his heirs. We're no longer outsiders. We are insiders. We are his heirs. And and this is so important for us to understand. Take a look at What Paul says later in Romans 8, he says, hey, since we're God's kids, we are his heirs. In fact, he says, together with Christ, because whatever Jesus has, we have. Whatever we get from Jesus, whatever Jesus gets from the Father, we get. When the Father looks at at Jesus, whatever he sees in Jesus, he sees in you and me. This is what it means that we are heirs together with Christ. We are heirs of God's glory. But there's a catch to this. If we share in God's glory, which we do, then we must also share in Jesus' suffering. So whatever Jesus has, we have. Whatever Jesus is, we are. That is absolutely incredible. Because that's not how we see ourselves many times, is it? But God sees us through the lens of Jesus, and, and we're asked to perceive God through the lens that Jesus used when he prayed to God. And this means that we are God's kids, and we are freed from sin's power. You know, we see ourselves as still struggling with sin. We see the areas where we fall short, the areas where we fail, but Jesus, God sees Jesus in us. He sees us as his kids, and we are free from sin's Power. This is what Galatians says. God sent Jesus to buy freedom for us who were once slaves so that he could adopt us as his very own children. And because we are God's children, God has sent the spirit of his son into our hearts. And get this, this is so cool, prompting us to call out Abba, Father. This is so cool. There's this prophecy that God longs for his people to call out to him as Father. And now Paul says God has put his spirit into our hearts, prompting us to call out, Daddy, Father. Isn't this great? So this this covenant relationship is powerful. It's the image of family. It's the image of that family bond. You cannot shake the family bond. You just can't. Blood is thicker than water. What does that expression mean? It means you can't change family. You can't change family. Once God sees you as part of his family, you are in. And God is now in a covenant relationship with you, and it means that he will never leave you, he will never forsake you, and he has adopted you, and you are his. You belong to him. And if you think think about it, your family is a part of your identity. In In fact, your family is a source of your identity. For, for better or worse, your identity is linked to who your family is. And, and you and I don't get to choose uh, that. We're just born into whatever family that we're born into, but we get our identity from our family. We get our DNA from our family. You know, they're doing some incredible research um, with our genetic code, and, and it's amazing. Half of it I don't understand, but the half that I do understand just looks amazing. In fact, Francis Collins headed up the Human Genome Project in the late 90s and early 2000s, mapping out the DNA of humans. He won a Nobel Prize for that, and he moved from being an atheist to being a Christian while he was mapping out the DNA of humans, because as he learned about how our cells are encoded and how the code in our cells triggers everything about us, and this code, he he figured, is so complex, this code had to be written by somebody. It's too complex to be random. So he moved from being an atheist to being a Christian because of his study of DNA. And we get our DNA from our families. We get our sense of humor from our families. We get our perception of self, especially in our early years from our family. We get our confidence or our lack of confidence from our family. Some of us can go to the bank and get a better loan because of our family, because of the resources that our family has. And so we get our resources from our family. We get a great start in life, or maybe we get a bad start in life depending on who our family is. We get our work ethic 
from our family. And, and these days, family means grandparents and grandkids and parents and kids and step-parents and kids and foster parents and kids. We have all kinds of different situations that have become family, but our family unit contributes to our sense of self, to our sense of identity. We get our identity from our family. So Jesus says, call God Father. When you pray, call him Abba Father. And as you see God as your Father, you're going to draw your sense of identity from God. In other words, you're not who other people say you are. You're not who that bully on the playground used to say that you are. You're not who that person who cuts you down every day at work says that you are. You're not who your family member that's bitter towards you, just constantly throwing out jabs towards you, says that you are. You are who your father says that you are. And who does God say that you are? Well, God says you are not condemned. Romans 8, 1. How many times... Do you feel condemned by the weight of your past mistakes or your past guilt or your past sins and you just feel so unworthy and so guilty for what happened in your past and the times that you've blown it? And God says, you are not condemned. There is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. You're forgiven of your sins. You have the right to be called God's children. No one can take that identity away from you. You are saved by grace through faith. You are blessed. How many of you know that you're blessed today, that in Jesus you are blessed in so many ways beyond what you can understand? You're blessed. You're alive in Christ. You're understood by God. Just think about that. How many times do you go through life and you feel misunderstood? How many times at work, at home, at school, do you just feel like nobody gets me? Nobody understands me. I wish there was somebody who knew where I was coming from or what I was about. God says he understands you. God says, I know you. I know your inner being. I perceive your thoughts from afar. I know where you go and what you do. I know what you've experienced. God says, I get you. I understand you. I know you. You're God's special possession. You're a holy people. God sees you as holy. Do you get that? Even though, let, let's not forget, God is making us more like Jesus. God is making us more sanctified. God is making us more holy. But even in that, God calls us holy. Not because of what we've done, but because of what Jesus has done for us. God sees us as holy. He says, you are a chosen people. You are a holy nation, a people belonging to God. You are holy. So when you see yourself in the mirror, you can look yourself in the eyes You you ever struggle to look at yourself in the eyes sometimes? You can look up, you can lift up your head, you can remember, yes, God is working on me, God is growing me, but remind yourself, God sees you as holy because of Christ. God sees you as righteous because of Christ. You are a citizen of heaven, you have a new passport, you're part of a new country, you're a new creation. God, the old is gone, the new has come. You're fearfully and wonderfully made. And this is just a small list. There's so much more. Watchman Nee said, outside of Christ I'm weak, but inside of Christ I am strong. Someone said, my deepest awareness of myself is that I am deeply loved by Jesus Christ and I have done nothing to deserve it. Someone else said, define yourself as radically loved by God. This is the true self. Every other identity is an illusion. Someone else said, who, am I in, who I am in Christ is amazing, but Christ, who Christ is in me is the real story. That's beyond amazing. So we go from father to identity, and this covenant identity gives us, God gives us, inspires obedience. It's a great saying, and it's so true. The more you affirm who you are in Christ, the more your behavior will begin to reflect your true identity. The more you affirm who you are in Christ, the more your behavior will begin to reflect your true identity. And I I think we understand that every family has rules. You know, God's family is no different. When you go out into the world, you are a representative of your family. 
There are family guidelines that we all follow that are designed to make life better for us. God created us. He knows the best way for us to live in the world so that we can experience the best possible life. And in spite of that, the suffering that we take on, and and there's a right way to do things, there's a wrong way to do things. And Jesus says there's a way that leads to life, and there's a way that leads away from life. And, And part of what it means to be in a covenant relationship is that God desires us to grow and to change, and, and, and so our response to this new identity that God gives to us is obedience, and obedience flows from our sense of identity. We, we forgive others because God has forgiven us. We love others because God has loved us. We love our enemies because God loved us while we were still his enemies, because God loved us when we were unlovable, and our obedience brings glory to the Father, and to the family, and rises to God like worship. Take a look at this. This is what's called the covenant triangle. I don't know if you've seen this before. It's a picture of God's design for us. It's the ideal picture for us. Uh, It's God's ideal picture for us. This is what it means to be in a covenant relationship with God. We have our Father God, and we have our identity, and we have our obedience. So this is what Jesus is driving at when he says, here's how you pray. Our Father who is in heaven, holy is your name. He's, he's saying, go to God as your ideal Father. Lean into that with all of your understanding. Picture God as an ideal Father, as the perfect Father. God is your our Creator, our Father. God has made a covenant with us because of Jesus and what He did on the cross. God pours His identity into us as we go to God, as we worship God, as we learn about God, as we talk to God, as we relate to God. We learn more and more about our identity. And, and the more we learn about our identity, the more our behavior begins to reflect who we are and our obedience rises to God like worship. So that's the covenant triangle. It's the picture of how we are meant to be. Abba, Father, who is in heaven, holy is your name. The Father gives us identity. Identity leads to obedience. Our obedience rises like worship. Holy is your name. This covenant triangle is so practical. It's a God principle that just makes sense. Here, here's the thing. Some of us come to God and it's all rules. Some of us view God from only the left side of that triangle, only, only the one side of that triangle. It's just obedience in God and we're just trying to obey God on our own strength and then God becomes this cosmic cop trying to catch us doing bad stuff and we're trying to do all the right things to please God or we've given up because we can't do the right things and we've messed up so badly that we just stop trying. And if it's all rules, if we lean in only to the rules side, then it will be a legalistic relationship. And that's going to color how we see God and how we talk to God and how we relate to God. And then some of us lean in too much on the other side of the triangle. We really love the idea that God loves us and we revel in that and there's no obedience. And when we do that, when we look at God that way, we're like the rich kids who flaunt their identity. Yeah, I can do what I want because my dad is, you know, a big deal in this town get pulled over by a cop. Well, officer, do you know who my dad is? Come on, do you really want to give me a ticket? I can do what I want because my dad is the most powerful being in the universe, and he loves me. And and if it's all identity, then it ends up being cheap grace, and we end up thinking we have a license to do whatever we want. And, you know, I can get away with that. God loves me. God won't do anything. I'm not condemned. I'm loved. You know, free grace, a grace that doesn't mean anything a license to sin. So we, we live on one side of the triangle. We have this legalistic relationship with God. When we live on the other side of this, the triangle, we have a license to do whatever we want. But when we put all three together, it becomes this beautiful thing and it forms this ideal picture of how Jesus is wanting us to relate to God, of what a healthy relationship with God is like. You know, this plays out in our lives in, in so many ways. Just think about your kids. Are any of your kids struggling to obey you? Uh, are you struggling to get your kids to do what you want? Are your kids rebelling? May, maybe they have a rules relationship with you, and you have a rules relationship with them, and maybe what they need is for you to lean into identity. 
Maybe they need to know that they are loved and accepted and that you will always be there for them. Maybe you need to establish a a family identity and a family culture. And if you establish a healthy family culture, then the obedience side will just get easier. Maybe there's there's too much love and not enough family rules. and, And that's not good for your family either. So the way that God does it is a healthy way to do it. Or think about your business Having trouble getting your employees to do what you need them to do? Ask yourself, what kind of culture am I creating? Do your staff know that you love them? Do your staff know that you, uh, that you support them? Do your staff have the emotional tools, the emotional culture that they need to succeed? Or, or maybe the rules aren't clear enough, and maybe it's an atmosphere of all, uh, all atmosphere and no productivity, and you, your staff are taking advantage of you because it's too easy. Or, or maybe you need to look at that, but with God's way, healthy obedience comes out of a healthy culture. Spiritually, the more you affirm your identity in Christ, the more your behavior is going to begin to reflect your identity in Christ. So so how does that work out practically? Just a couple of ideas for today. Just as you pray, when you sit down to pray, just picture God as your ideal father. Abba, father, daddy. Picture God caring for you like that ideal father. When you talk to God, picture yourself talking to that ideal father. He loves you. He wants the best for you. He has the best in mind for you. When he sets out a rule for you to follow, it's because he loves you. He wants the best. He wants you to be the best that you can possibly be. When you talk to God, think of a father that knows what you need before you even ask him. God knows what you need. God cares about what you need. You're his family. You're his son. You're his daughter. Think about identity. Think about an area of identity that maybe is weak for you, that you just constantly struggle to really accept and comprehend that area of identity in your life. How can you you lean into that area of identity this week? Maybe it's just pulling out the Bible and just... Just starting to look through verses that are about that aspect of your identity. And just starting to get God's word into your heart and into your spirit. God's truth into you about who you are in Christ. Think about obedience. What areas are you representing the Father well? You know, so often when we think about obedience, our mind jumps to where we're failing, where we're faltering. Think about obedience. Where are you serving the Father well? And picture God celebrating that. Picture God saying, look at, look at my son, look at my daughter. Look at how they're serving me so faithfully. Look at how they're faithful in these areas in their life. Picture God celebrating your obedience. And then maybe think of one area where you're not representing the Father well and just say, God, what can I do to change this one area? Would you show me? Show me what's missing in my identity that's maybe causing me to struggle in this area. Show me what it means to follow you in this area, God. I want to close and just just pray over you. Pray over those that are watching in, in your living rooms today. Just pray that we could just begin to grasp just a little bit more our identity. Father God, I pray that you would help us to remember that Jesus taught us to call you Abba, Father. That Jesus taught us when we pray to pray as if we are adopted kids into your family and we are loved and we are accepted and we're known, we're understood, we're blessed, we're heirs. There's no condemnation when we look to you in prayer We're looking to you as a father who loves us and knows us. Blood is thicker than water and you will never leave us. You will never forsake us, Lord God. I pray that you would give us a a glimpse, a deeper glimpse as we sit down to pray that we can just know you're out of a father. And Father, I pray over those areas of our life where maybe we struggle with our identity, I pray, God, that you would speak the truth of identity into 
us here in the room this morning and into the hearts of those who are watching this in their living rooms. God, would you speak the truth of our identity into us? And as we know who we are, Father, I thank you that obedience just just starts to get easier. It starts to come because it's linked to your love for us. It's linked to your acceptance of us. It's linked to the identity you've given to us. We want to rep- represent you well, Father God. We want to be servants of your household. And so would you move us from identity into obedience? Would you speak into our hearts what that means for our life today, for our life this week? We thank you, God, and we bless you, God. Abba, Father, who is in heaven, Holy is your name. Thank you, God, that you love us. Now may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you. May the Lord be gracious to you and give you his perfect peace. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. And all God's people said, amen, amen. Be blessed. Have a great day.